one of our advanced webinar series, Creating and Using Normalized NDVI or, or Normalized Difference Vegetation Index from Satellite Imagery. My name is Cindy Schmidt, and I will be your instructor today along with Amber McCollum. Um, for those of you that had a hard time getting in um, earlier this morning, um, the seminar room actually only opens up about 15 minutes before the session. So if you try to get in before 15 minutes, then it says um, that it's full. So the, just a heads up for next time. Um, we'll try to change that to make it so it's 30 minutes ahead of time. But if you run into that same issue next week, just remember um, to not call in until about 15 minutes ahead of time. For this course, we're going to have one session per week each Wednesday from 12 to 1 Eastern Standard Time, so the same time every Wednesday for the next four weeks. Since this is an advanced course, we'll start with a short lecture, but it will mostly consist of hands-on exercises using open source software and web tools. So this is a little bit different than some of the web webinars that we've had in the past. In addition to demonstrating the exercises live during the session, we have developed documents that provide step-by-step -step instruction on each exercise. That way you can do the exercises yourself after the webinar is finished. Depending on the length of the exercise, we will spend some time answering questions at the end of each session. You can find all the course materials that you need um, at the website listed here. This includes past recordings, data links, and homework exercises. We'll have a Q&A session at the end of each session. You can also email me or my colleague, Amber McCollum, at the email addresses listed below. But I do want to let you know, because we have limited resources, we're only going to be answering questions pertaining directly to the material we are teaching in this course. So we'll answer questions about the content of the presentations, the exercises, or the homework, but nothing outside of that. Each week, we'll have a follow-on homework, which will be submitted through Google Forms. You'll need to complete the exercise in order to answer the homework questions. So it's really important that you download all the material um, that we give you so you can get that material again on the website or you can get it um, on the right hand side under files. This week it's required that you download the same imagery that we, that we will be using in the in-class exercise and the homework. So we have a specific Landsat image that we need you to download if you want to follow along with us. You will also need the same imagery for the week two exercise and the homework. In some cases, though, we will give you the option to download your own imagery for your own particular area of interest. To receive credit for the homework, you must submit all answers via Google Forms by the specified deadline. If it's after the deadline, we can't accept the homework. The deadline for week one is in two weeks, Wednesday, February 24th. To receive a certificate of completion, and this is important, you must attend all four live webinars and complete all four homework assignments. So again, this is a little different than some of our previous webinars um, because we really want you to be able to understand the material well. It does take some time to process these certificates, so you can expect to receive them about two months after the completion of the course. There are two main prerequisites for this course. First, you should know and understand the fundamentals of remote sensing. You can watch our on-demand course listed above, which includes two one-hour recorded webinars that you can watch on your own time. It is also necessary for you to download and in install QGIS. This is a freely available open source software we will use throughout the remainder of this course. It's available for both Macs and PCs. You will need this to complete all homework assignments. We have also included some helpful instructions for installation of QGIS on the webinar webpage. Although you do not have to have any previous experience using QGIS, it's useful to have some experience using geospatial data. As I mentioned before, you can access all the course materials on our RSET website. Each week, you will be able to find 
um, a PDF of the PowerPoint presentation in both English and Spanish, any data necessary, and the PDF of each week's in-class exercise. You'll be able to get a link to view the recordings of each week's seminar, and finally, the PDF of each homework assignment and a link to the Google form for homework submission. Please note that in order to view the webinar recordings, you have to register. This helps us to keep track of who is viewing them. Once you register, you'll be automatically um, able to view the recording. Throughout this course, we will review NDVI concepts. We'll also demonstrate how to access and download both Landsat and MODIS imagery. We will also provide in-class exercises that demonstrate how to process the imagery in QGIS. We're going to conduct live demonstrations of websites that provide more, some more standardized MODIS NDVI products in addition to showing how to process them in QGIS. This advanced course is a new approach for us and we hope it provides you with some valuable expertise in creating NDVI images. One, of, one thing I want to mention again is that although we will answer any of your questions pertaining to this course, we will not be able to answer general QGIS questions or questions about how to do any additional image processing. But if you'd like, we can send you some additional resources to answer those questions. Here's an overview of what we'll be covering in this course. All four weeks will consist of a mix of lectures, in-class exercises, and demonstrations. This week, we'll provide an overview of NDVI and conduct an in-class exercise that introduces you to QGIS. So this week, first we'll review NDVI, then discuss some NDVI applications and examples. Then we'll con conduct the in-class exercise to familiarize everybody with the basics of the QGIS platform, then conduct some simple steps, such as adding imagery to your project. We will then conclude with our question and answer session. So first we'll start off with our brief NDVI review. Since all of you have completed the prerequisites, I will run through this portion fairly quickly. As you recall, when sunlight strikes plant leaves, the chlorophyll in those leaves strongly absorbs visible light, and the cell structure of the leaves reflect green and strongly reflects near-infrared light. This is portrayed in the graphic on the top as well in the graph on the bottom. The two key wavelengths for NDVI are the red and near-infrared. Those are two key things that you need to remember for our course this um, month. In the graph, you can see where the red is being absorbed, where there's low reflectance, and the near-infrared is highly ref reflective. NDVI is the relationship between the red and the near-infrared wavelengths. The actual formula is specified here. The values of NDVI for an individual pixel range from minus 1 to 1. Any pixel between minus 1 and 0 means no vegetation, and pixels close to 1 indicate the highest possible density of green leaves. The picture on the right shows that healthy green vegetation absorbs most of the visible light and reflects a large portion of the near-infrared light. Unhealthy, sparse, or senescing vegetation reflects more visible light and less near-infrared light. You can see the difference in the resulting NDVI values below the image. The green vegetation has a value closer to 1, while the brown vegetation has a value closer to 0. NDVI is one of the most widely used vegetation indices in the world and has been used to determine the state of vegetation over many spatial and temporal resolutions. Vegetation health is generally a measure of the amount of reflected near-infrared light with healthier vegetation reflecting more infrared light than the unhealthy vegetation, as I mentioned in the previous slide, thus having a value closer to 1, as noted in the previous slide. NDVI can also be used to better understand phenology of plants throughout the year, particularly to track greenup events. 
NDVI has also been used recently by farmers to improve agricultural production and manage water resources. Using average NDVI values in a particular region, periods of reduced plant growth relative to the average can be an indicator of drought. This may also relate to the soil moisture in a region. The leaf area index is defined as the one-sided green leaf area per unit ground surface in broad leaf canopies. Recent studies have shown a near linear relationship with LAI and NDVI. NDVI values in forested regions can also help quantify carbon stocks and can aid countries in carbon monitoring programs. This figure on the right shows an example of how NDVI can indicate drought and crop conditions in important agricultural regions. The brown colors show below average crop conditions and the green areas show above average crop conditions. So we'll be showing you how to do this kind of anomaly mapping um, later on in our sessions. This NDVI image was derived from Landsat satellite data and shows vegetation density across the greater Panama Canal watershed. The darker green, the green area, the more green vegetation is present. The rainforests of Panama stand out clearly as the dark green swaths on either side of the Panama Canal. These forests harbor a very diverse community of plants and animals and also help reduce erosion and sedimentation to the canal. The light green and brown areas are more sparsely vegetated pastures and croplands. The white areas show areas of human development. Plant phenology is the annual dynamic of vegetation greenness that can be tracked using vegetation indices. In the graph on the top, you can see the progression of vegetation dynamics as seasons change. In North America, early in the year, which is winter, there are little to no leaves on the trees, resulting in low NDVI values. When spring arrives, the vegetation greens, greens up and NDVI increases until it peaks in the summer. Then, as vegetation senesces and lose their leaves, the NDVI declines again. The, the image below shows the difference in greenness in the winter versus the summer in North America. NDVI anomalies are often used to show current vegetation patterns relative to the long-term averages. This can be calculated by subtracting the long-term mean from the current value and is often done on a monthly basis. For example, if the anomaly is negative, this indicates that the vegetation is less green than normal, which may be indicative of drought-like conditions. The brown areas in these pictures show negative anomalies for the years specified. Here's another example of an NDVI anomaly map that highlights the current California drought. The image on the right shows NDVI anomalies from January 17th to February 1st, 2014 against average conditions over the same period from the past decade. The brown colors indicate below average anomalies and the green colors represent above average anomalies. Notice that much of the Central Valley, which in California, is this area right here. And the central coast of California, which is down here, has below average vegetation values in regions where there's a large amount of agriculture. While you can see some green values here in the Sierra Nevada, so this is the Sierra Nevada mountain range right along here, that is actually a function of very low snowpack levels compared to the average. Usually during this time period, most of the vegetation is covered with snow. Thus,
I'll use your higher than than usual. This is also bad news. point here And share my Green. So that I can step you through our exercise for today. Just as a check, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, great, I'm getting some yeses. So we'll go ahead and move forward. All right, so for today's exercise, we'll be working through a brief introduction to QGIS. I will also show you how to download a Landsat image and import this into QGIS. It's important that you download the same image as Cindy mentioned. Um, this will be used also for next week's exercise and homework. Okay, so let's get started. First, we will open QGIS. I have it saved here in my doc, but you can also find it in your applications or your uh, programs uh, if you're on a um, Windows system. So when QGIS starts up, you will generally see a little tip that happens once it, once it opens up. You can decide to keep these tips or to um, say I've had enough. You will also notice I have some recent projects here. 
um, but we are going to go ahead and start a new project. So we'll click on this blank screen here for new project. First, I just wanted to provide a little bit of an overview of the portions uh, within the GIS. So this first area located here is the layers panel. And the layers panel will display all of your layers that will be shown in the map. You can also click within the layers here to find out more information about them. At the top, you will see many different toolbars. So you have tools like zoom in, zoom out, sort of your standard tools that you'll use um, on a regular basis. You can also move around these tools um, and switch in and out specific tools that are most useful for your work. This large area here in the middle is the map canvas, and this is where your map will be displayed once we add layers into QGIS. Down here at the bottom is your status bar, and this will show you things like the coordinates of where you're located, the scale which you can change, um, and some information of, about the uh, project you're working on. Finally, on the far left-hand side, we have a list of different types of files you can add into the map, shown here. So as you can see, I'm just following along this exercise that you all should um, have access to. So you can feel free to follow along now um, or follow along later. And this is how you will be able to answer all of your homework questions. So just as a heads up. Okay, great. So part two, we are going to um, show you QGIS plugins. So plugins are optional tools that you can import into QGIS for additional functionality. And these are tools that other users have, been cre have created and they've been approved through the QGIS community since this is an open source software. So to do this, we will just go up here to the top and click on plugins and manage and install plugins. This will take a minute to load the repository of plugins available, um, but then you should be able to see um, the list of all of your plugins. Okay, great. So here um, on the left is a list of all of the uh, available plugins, and we have things like accuracy assessment or buffer by percentage, and you can add these in based on the type of work you'll be doing. A couple plugins that were mentioned here in this exercise are the Open Layers plugin and the Semi-Automatic Classification plugin, as well as the Grass plugin. So in order to install a plugin, you can simply search for it here. So we'll search for Open Layers, and you'll see it here. Because this has already been installed, it has a little blue icon next to it. For some of these others that have not been installed, there's a, a green icon located next to it. Another useful plugin might be the semi-automatic classification plugin. So this one here does some, some simple classifications. Um, in order to install a plugin like this, you would simply click here on Install Plugin and it would be added to your QGIS repository. And so once you've installed a plugin, you won't need to install it again each time you use QGIS. Um, you just might need to update it here. So another useful one is Grass. And you can see here, you can, you can um, this is actually included in QGIS when you download it. So you don't need to install it here, but that's another useful one. So I encourage you all to uh, explore additional plugins based on your needs. Okay, now we will add and modify vector layers. So we'll go over here to add vector layer. We'll see that the, the description of the tool pops up if we just hover over it. So we'll click on this. Then you need to browse for your data set here. And I have all of my week one data stored here. And all you need to do then is click on the California 
projected shapefile, which is the first one we will add, and click Open. Notice that there are many different files for each of these layers, and the one that we're interested in is the shapefile. So .shp is the one that you always want to add into your QGIS. So we'll click on Open here, and then we'll click on Open up here. So now you should see the a layer added into your map, and then you should also see the layer over here in your Layers panel. Now, we might not want to use this pretty pink color that QGIS automatically chooses for us, so we can go in and modify the style of these layers. In order to do this, we can right-click or control-click on our layer and go into Properties. This should automatically take you to the Style tab listed here. And here we can change things like the color, the transparency, and multiple other things. So for this example, we will just choose the land symbol, which gives us a nice um, greenish color there, and click on Apply. When we click on Apply, you can see that this new color has been um, changed within our California shapefile. Then we can click on OK. Now we want to repeat these steps for a couple of the other um, example vector files that we had, the California cities and the Yosemite boundary. So we're going to do the same exact thing and browse for our data here in our data folder. And then we are going to add the, the cities and the Yosemite, again, .shp file. We're going to open and then open here. And you can, again, see that they have automatically been added to the map. We're going to change some of the style of these layers as well. So first, we are going to modify the California cities, opening the properties option again. And for this one, we're just going to choose the city symbol. And we're going to go ahead and change the color to a blue. And all of these can be changed based on your preferences. So these are just examples of what can be done. Again, we can click on Apply, and notice that those colors have been changed. We can also label features of a vector file here using the Label tab. So we'll go up to here and click on Show Labels for this layer, and then Label With, and we click on this little blue Y, and we'll label with the name. And I'll show you in a little bit, uh, a little bit later in this exercise how you know where the appropriate label is within this file. So we can look at the attributes of the, of the shape file. We can then click on Apply, and we'll see that the cities have been labeled in our map. Now, if they don't quite look how, how we want to, we can modify some of the uh, properties of the labels themselves. So we're going to choose the buffer option and then draw text buffer. We can keep all of these others as default. Another thing we can do is we can create a shadow behind the, la the labels in order to see them better. And we'll keep everything else um, as default here. Finally, we'll click on placement and we can sort of offset the label around the point. Um, and again, this is just cartographic um, preference. So we can change the distance by clicking here to one millimeter. And then click Apply. Then we can click OK and look at the labels. And we can see that they're a little easier to read um, on the map here. We can also go in and modify the Yosemite shapefile. Again, going back to Properties. We'll go back to the Style tab now. And we can change the color to a nice dark green. And if we click on this simple fill, we can also modify the border. So we can change that to a red if we'd like. Apply and OK. And we can see that those have been changed as well. We can also, again, as we did before with the cities layer, we can add a label, show labels for this layer. 
and label based on unit type. Click apply and then OK. Oh, whoops. It's not the label I wanted. Unit name. Apply. Now it should say Yosemite. <laughs> Great. We can also do similar modifications to the label here. We can give it a buffer, maybe make the buffer a little less, maybe 0.7 millimeters. Great, then we can click apply and okay, and we see that Yosemite National Park is labeled on our map here. As I mentioned, we can also view the attributes of some of these layers using the attribute table. So if we click on the California cities, the one we're interested in, and click on open attribute table, we can see some of the features of this layer. So we can see the longitude and latitude of each of the, the cities, um, the, the name, which is the California the state, and then the, the name of each city listed here. So we now know when we go in to label these, this is the, the category that we want to label each of the cities. Now, when, when we're using QGIS, it's often important to save the project as you go along. So you've made some of these stylistic changes. You want to make sure you don't lose your information. So you can go up here to project and save as. And we'll just go ahead and save this within our same folder and call it something like week one. And click on save. This is really important um, as you go through the exercise and as you're doing your homework, um, so you don't lose very much along the way. So I continually save projects as I'm going along. This will really benefit you in the long run. Now, going back to using our plugins, we could add some background imagery to this map using our Open Layers plugin. So if we come up to Web, we can see our Open Layers plugin. And these are um, multiple different layers that are freely available um, via the web. So we'll just use Google Maps and Google Satellite and click on this here. Now, as you're noticing within my QGIS, it might take a while to load a Google Satellite layer. Um, oftentimes, it takes a lot of um, processing power to load in these large maps. And these maps are global, so we think about the, the amount of time it takes to do this. And that's why I mentioned saving the map ahead of time, because sometimes loading in these open layers can cause um, QGIS to crash or, or issues to happen. So I recommend saving before you do. And oftentimes adding something like this at the final stages of, of creating a map. You'll also notice that the Google Satellite came in below, above all of our other layers. So we, we can't see any of our other layers here. I'm just going to toggle around to see if I can display this, there we go, display the Google satellite image. Sometimes it just takes a little fudging um, before you can actually see the full satellite image. So as we notice here in the layers panel, the Google satellite uh, open layer is on top of all of our other layers. And in order to show the other layers, we can simply drag this below. Great, now we can see our other layers that we um, were working with. Uh, another uh, helpful feature is this zoom to layer uh, tool. So, if, for example, if my screen just moved slightly, we can click on the California layer and click on zoom to layer. And we should get right back to where we were. Again, as I mentioned, the, the, oftentimes the Google satellite creates a little bit of lag and processing issues. But it looks really nice, so um, oftentimes it's something nice to add at the end. 
once we've added something like this, we could also go into our California layer and go to properties and we could change the transparency. So if we go to the style tab, we can change the layer transparency by sliding this circle here or by simply typing in our transparency, then click OK. And now we can see through the layer and see some of these features of California um, underneath the um, California shape file. So for now, we are just going to go ahead and remove this Google satellite image so we don't have any more issues with um, some of the, the processing of displaying the image. We can do that by right clicking and going to remove. And we can go ahead and remove that. Great. So the next portion, part four of the exercise, we will go through downloading a Landsat image from the USGS Global Visualization Viewer or Glovis website. And the link to this website is shown here on the exercise. And I've clicked on that link here and pulled it up in my browser. One, a couple of things to note about the Glovis website is that in order to uh, download imagery, you do need to register for an account. Accounts are freely available um, and you just need to register and you'll receive um, a registration email to confirm your registration. Another thing to note is that you need the most updated version of Java in order to display the um, imagery here. So if you get, if you pull up the website and nothing is being shown here, you might want to make sure that your Java is up to date. It also might prompt you to update your Java when you visit this website, just as a heads up. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're interested in our Landsat image. So we'll go to this collection tab here at the top, scroll down to Landsat archive, and we're interested in a Landsat 8 image, which is the most recent Landsat, and we'll click on that here. You'll notice that once we've chosen that, our display here on the right has, mo has been modified to display Landsat 8 imagery. The next thing we want to do is we want to obtain an image in California to correspond with what we've already done in our map. This small window here shows you where you are at in the world um, with this red dot, and that's being displayed here. So we just want to change. We know our path and row, which is something that you can look up. We can modify this to 43 and 33, which is our path and our row of the Landsat scene that we're interested in downloading. You could also, if you want to, move this red dot over to an area and slide it around to then move the image here on, on the right. But we, we know where we wanna go, so we're gonna type in 43 and 33. And remember to click go. Once this happens, you can see that our red dot moved and we now have in the yellow highlighted box, our Landsat scene that, that we're interested in. The next thing we wanna make sure we have is the correct um, date. So we wanna make sure this is September, 2015. Then we click go. Again, then we're, we're just directed towards our scene here. In order to download this scene, we can then add it to our scene list. So we click on add and we notice that the Landsat scene has been added here. And we're going to click send to cart. And the cart here works more or less like a shopping cart um, on an online website like Amazon. So we're going to send it to our cart. When you do that, uh, another tab will open up that will show you your basket. So if you have multiple scenes that you've sent to your cart, all of them will be listed here. For now, we just have our Landsat image that we're interested in shown here. Here we have the entry ID, which is the Landsat naming convention for each scene, uh, which we will review next week uh, during our review lecture portion of the webinar. But if you click on this here, you can see the thumbnail of your image that you're, down, you're interested in downloading. And you can see some of the attributes about the image. So we have things like the identifier, the path, the row, um, 
another interesting feature here is the scene cloud cover, which here is really small. We want to um, limit the amount of cloud cover to make this um, a viable image. So that's a good thing that we don't have many clouds in our, in our image. So if we continue to scroll down to the, uh, to the bottom of this website, you'll see a little download button here. If you click on that, You'll be taken to another tab where you have multiple download options. You can see that you can download a natural color image, thermal quality image, but what we're interested in is the level one GeoTIFF data product. And this is gonna provide us with all the useful bands of the Landsat image that we are interested in. Here, you'll click on download, and the download will begin automatically. There are a couple things to mention about downloading it directly this way, is that the amount of time it takes to download the image will vary depending on your connection speed. Um, it took me about 25 minutes to download my entire level one GeoTIFF data product, which contains all the, the Landsat bands. Additionally, you need to be able to unzip the file once it's been downloaded. You'll receive the file as a .tar, and this will require you to have the archive utility on a Mac or 7-zip on a, a Windows machine. So um, I've listed the, the linked to seven zip Here and a tutorial. on how to extract files on the dot Um, so that's going to be very important. when you actually
um, download the image um, and open it. Great. Thank you, Amber. Um, I just want to remind everyone that you can access all, all the material. materials that you, you need um, for these sessions on our, our website and we've been posting it periodically. Um, in the chat. Um, but you can get the presentation both Again, in English and Spanish. Um, You can get the uh, The data, the image, images that that Amber. Um,
was mentioned. So the land on that the image as well as the the shape files that you're going to need. need. You Should um the, the so exercise. And then the a home. Work, which is the good Doc. So why do we all of me doing of that? be the um um on our um, website and we'll post that again at the end PDF of, um, the of this session that we use today and go so I just want to remind you of I... um, our contact information so you see mine and Amber is listed there if you have um, general questions about our set you can contact um, the program lead Anna Prados um, and then, um, again, there's our um, website URL. So I want to thank everybody for joining us for this week, um, deriving NDVI from, and next week we'll be deriving NDI, NDVI from Landsat. So we'll actually be using um, Landsat in QGIS to derive a, a Landsat a NDVI image. Um, and we'll also discuss um, coloring up that Landsat image to make it look a little nicer, um, as Amber has mentioned. So we can open up the floor for uh, questions if you have any at this point. Um, and also, um, as I mentioned before, you can e email us during the week if you have any.
So there's a question, are you only using instrument bands from the same platform to calculate NDVI? So again, we're going to be calculating NDVI. We're going to be calculating NDVI from Landsat. Um, MODIS actually has an NDVI product that we're going to be doing some anomaly mapping with. Um, so we'll be working with two different um, sensors, Landsat and MODIS. So there's a question, if, if a DM is not used, how accurate is NDVI in mountain areas? So it, that's a question um, that's a little bit different than what we're going to be addressing here. Um, we're not uh, getting into the accuracy of the location of the NDVI. Certainly if you had uh, a DEM, um, that will help you um, determine NDVI in particular um, mountain areas, um, but we're kind of looking, showing you how to calculate NDVI um, and then adding a DEM is actually a whole um, different, a whole different process that we aren't going to go into this time. Okay, so at this point it looks 